Okay, we are, again, looking at Romans, the ninth chapter. Everybody in person should be there by now, hopefully, after I've gone through all those announcements. And everybody out there, be opening your Bibles to Romans 9, and our starting place for today is verse number 29. The outline for chapter 9, this is, again, a relatively long chapter, 33 verses. Uh, Paul mentions his concern for the lost in verses 1 to 5. And especially he's concerned about the Jews who are lost and they're rejecting Christ. It is not the fault of God. Paul mentions the faithfulness of God in verses 6 to 13, the righteousness of God, verses 14 to 18, and the justice of God, verses 19 to 29. And he'll wrap up the chapter talking about the grace of God in verses 30 through 33. Again, the Jews felt like they knew that they were saved simply because they were Jews. They were descendants of Abraham, and therefore they were saved, and God says that's just not the case. If you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved my way and through my son, and how dare you try to tell me how to save people. And that's sort of the gist of this chapter and, and perhaps the next as well. He's going to say in this section that nobody has the right to rebel against God and escape the consequences. Now, we are free moral agents, or we have the ability to choose. God made us that way. We're not puppets on a string. So one has the choice, if he wishes, to rebel against God. But don't think you're going to escape the consequences. So Jews, if you think you're saved just because you're a descendant of Abraham and that God is, owes you salvation that way, you certainly... If you want to think that way, then that's your choice, but you need to know there are consequences for that line of thinking, and that's verse 29. In fact, Adam, if you will read for us uh, uh, Romans 9, 29 to 33, rounding out the chapter. I appreciate that, uh, that reading. Now I'm using the King James Version. Adam used a, a newer translation. And so if I can get my voice to acting right this morning. King James says, Isaiah, and that is who? Isaiah. Again, there, that's not a mistranslation. That's just the Greek form of the Hebrew name. And they, instead of translating it, sort of, I guess we would say transliterated, but it's Isaiah. He's talking about Isaiah. Isaiah said before. What does it mean to say something before? If I say before it's going to be sunny tomorrow, what am I doing? I'm making a prediction. Okay? And I may be right and I may be wrong, but any time a prophet of God made a prediction, guess what? They never missed. 100% success rate. Isaiah predicted this, and the verse, we won't take the time to read this verse, we will look at some of them, but this is, goes back to Isaiah 1 and verse 9. Except the Lord of, again the King James rendering, Seboeth. That word Seboeth looks an awful lot like what word? Sabbath. S-A-B-B-A-T-H, S-A-B-A-O-T-H. Is there a difference in those two words? I mean, it's only a couple of letters off. A little bit of a difference, isn't there? Is there a difference between the words hired and fired? Only one letter's difference, and they sound almost identical, hired and fired. But there's a big difference in those two words. Well, there's a big difference in these words Seboeth and Sabbath. So a couple of letters, my point is, a couple of letters can make a great big difference. 
I'll pick on Abby for a moment. Abby, what does your translation say except the Lord of hosts, H-O-S-T-S, or armies? Some translate that word armies. Uh, one refers to this word meaning uncountable, something that cannot be counted. The Lord of the uncountable. How many angels are there in heaven? They're without number, right? They're without number. Like the sand by the seashore, like the stars of heaven, the host of heaven are innumerable, I guess is the term my mind is, is searching for. All of heaven, all of creation is at the Lord's disposal. The Lord of the armies, the Lord of heavens. He is over all is the idea behind this. Unless God Almighty had left us a seed or offspring or remnant, unless God had left us a fragment of people, we would have turned out like Sodoma or Sodoma is Sodom, and we would have been like Gomorrah. Unless there had been a remnant left, we would have been just like Sodom and Gomorrah. What is his point? What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They wouldn't be here. That's exactly right, Neil. They were, we would use the word obliterated. And we all know why, don't we? It wasn't because they were inhospitable to visitors, as some wildly try to make them out to be. We know why they were destroyed, as Jude tells us, they were destroyed because of strange flesh or homosexual practices is the idea behind all of that. And the only ones who escaped the brimstone and fire were Lot and his two daughters, and they would not have escaped had the angels not practically drugged them out of town. Sodom and Gomorrah, they were so wicked, there were not how many righteous people found in those cities? Ten, right? Remember, remember who was it that tried to bargain God down? He went, started at 50 and went down? Abraham, didn't he? God, won't you, won't you spare those cities if, if 50 righteous are found? What did God say? I'll do it. You find 50, find, find 50 good men or people in Sodom and Gomorrah, and they'll, I'll leave them alone. Evidently, Abraham had an idea of how bad they were, so he started going not up in number, but down. What about 45? What about 40? What about, what, 30? What about 20? What about 10? God said, if you can find 10, which tells us what? There weren't 10 righteous people in those two cities. Now, I know we think our world today is bad, but I don't think we're quite as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, I believe there are more than 10. I believe there are more than 10 righteous people in Verona, Mississippi. Well, we've got that many more, plenty more than that here is the idea. But, you know, we, number-wise, probably heading in the wrong direction. Again, the point Paul is making in any of this, if it weren't for the faithful few among the Jews, the survivors, the faithful survivors, Israel would have been obliterated as Sodom and Gomorrah had been. Complete destruction of the Jewish nation. So we would, Paul is talking about the faithful few. It seems like every generation has had its faithful few. Can you think of some? What, Noah, Genesis chapter 6 through 9. How many righteous were found there in that world of evil? Eight. Eight people can make a difference, correct? Eight people. There have been ten. Sodom and Gomorrah would have been spared. Eight people. Noah. Uh, you just think of Josiah. I think of good kings of Judah. They have very few, but Josiah was a mighty good king. He made major reforms in the land of the Jews. Probably spared them from destruction. Uh, at least maybe put that off for a time because he was righteous and the people followed his his righteous lead. I sometimes wonder if, and, and then I'm just wondering, this is just my opinion, which is worth nothing. Sometimes I wonder if maybe 
the destruction of the world hasn't been spared up to now because of a few what? Good people. It may very well be that the faithful in the church are for the time being holding off God's destruction of the world, giving people an opportunity to come around and do right. I, I don't know that, that's just my fault. But I do know that uh, were it not for the faithful few among the Jews, the Jewish nation as a whole <clears throat> would, have been, would have been again destroyed. It's not the fault of God that the Jews are in this predicament, is Paul's point. And he's going to wrap up talking about the grace of God in verses 30 through 33. So verse 30, what shall we say then? In other words, I've said all this to say this. Okay, what conclusion can we draw? In view of the inclusion of the Gentiles and only a remnant of the Jews, what conclusion can we draw from this? Well, 30, the Gentiles, let me start talking about them. They did not follow after righteousness. We looked at that in Romans chapter 1, 18 to 32. How they turned from God and they just went down, 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 down. Talking about our ancestors, okay? They did not attain, they had no desire for God or godly things. They turned from Him. But the wonderful thing is that they have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. Upon hearing the gospel, many of the Gentiles obeyed the gospel. Again, formerly, they had no use for God or godly things. They went into paganism and idolatry. But now that the gospel has been preached to the Gentile nation, many of them are accepting and obeying and living for God. A tremendous change. Who would have ever thought? Who would have ever thought that a man could go and preach to the Assyrians and tell them, in 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown, and guess what the people of Nineveh did? They straightened up at the preaching of who? Jonah. Who would have ever thought? Jonah certainly didn't think they had straightened up. In fact, he hoped they wouldn't. He hoped they would burn. Who would have ever thought? Who would ever thought the Gentiles, who formerly had abandoned God, now hearing the good news of Jesus, have attained unto righteousness, that is, by obeying the gospel, the righteousness that comes of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Somebody has well remarked that one of the best evidences of the inspiration of the Bible is the Bible's ability to do what? Change people for the better. That is one of the evidences of the Bible's inspiration it's ability to change pagans, idolaters, into God-fearers and Christians. It has the power to do that. And so, wonderful, the Gentiles took advantage of the grace, the offer of the grace of God. That's verse 30. The ironic thing is, look what Israel did. 31. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness. He's talking about the law of Moses here. Again, keep in mind all the advantages the Jews had. They had the law of Moses. They had the presence of God. They witnessed the miracles of God. They were of the seed of Abraham, but they thought that's all that mattered. The Jews, though they had the law, has not attained to the law of righteousness. It's ironic, the Gentiles who some would say didn't have a chance, why wow, they've come around. The Jews who had all the advantages, well they thumbs down God's offer of salvation through Christ and rejected, rejected that much to the dismay of God and to the detriment of their own souls in so doing. And Paul talked about them in chapter 2 and chapter 3. For all their advantages, the Jews, the majority of the Jews would be lost. Ironic. We might make a parallel today. We think of, of those like me, people who have grown up in the church. 
since I was a little boy, since many were little children, the advantage of growing up in the church, having devoted Sunday school teachers and hearing godly sermon after sermon, one would think that people in that category would be the backbone and the strength of the church today. Many of them are. You wouldn't think that somebody out here who grew up in a godless home, never introduced to the Lord and the Bible and spiritual matters, you wouldn't think spiritually they would amount to anything, and yet, guess what? We often find out that they're the very ones who are among the strongest in the church today. People like me having had all the advantages, and then here are those who didn't have the advantages, and yet oftentimes they turn out stronger spiritually. And so sort of some iron, uh, irony there between, between the two. 32, why? Wherefore, why? Why did the Jews fall? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. What law? The law that taught circumcision. The law that taught the Sabbath. The law was not wrong. It served its purpose. It brought men to Christ. It was a tutor or a school bus driver, we might say, to bring them to school. Jesus is the school. It served its purpose. And here are people still on the bus, if you will, and they're not getting off the bus and going to school. That's the Jews. They're still trying to abide by the abolished law. And instead of obeying the Lord, they stumbled at that stumbling stone. What's it mean to stumble? You ever stumbled? Usually when we stumble, it doesn't happen in private, does it? Especially to those of us who get up in front of people. Usually we stumble right in front of everybody. And when we stumble and get up, what's the first thing we do? Look and see if anybody saw it. <laughs> and everybody saw it. You can believe everybody saw it, but that's the first thing we do. Uh, and usually people who witness that are not laughing at us. They feel for us. There's one, one fellow who got up to preach. He stumbled and fell and hit his, busted his lip and preached the whole sermon wiping blood off his lip. <laughs> well, you feel for somebody like that, right? But he just got up and kept on going. He just kept on going. We know what it means to stumble and trip to fall. Sometimes we stumble and it, well, it's just an accident. But here the Jews stumbled and it was their own fault that they tripped. They stumbled at that stumbling stone, and the stumbling stone is not an it, but a person. Who's the person they stumbled over? Jesus Christ. That's verse 33. As it is written. Where is this written, by the way? Who wrote this? Isaiah. Isaiah 28, Isaiah 8. As it is written, Isaiah predicted this. Behold, I lay in, I'm using the King James, Sion, S-I-O-N, or Zion, Z-I-O-N. Not a mistranslation, no problem. What does Sion, what city does Sion, or what was the city of Zion? Jerusalem, correct? Jerusalem. I lay in Jerusalem a stumbling stone and rock of offense. This is Isaiah's predictive prophecy of what God would do. I'm laying a stumbling stone. The stone, of course, is Jesus. Ephesians 2.20, he is the chief cornerstone. Whenever they built stone buildings, you always started in the corner, and you always wanted a stone that was square. Why? Why? You're going to build off that stone, right? You're going to lay a stone next to that stone. If that stone's out of square, guess what your walls are going to be? They're going to be out of square. You're going to have a mess of a building if you don't have a true stone for the corner. God is predicting, or through Isaiah predicting, I'm going to build my church. Jesus is going to be the foundation of that. If you get the foundation right, everything else is going to be right. He's the chief cornerstone but to the Jews, Jesus, instead of being a stone of salvation, became a stone of stumbling because they rejected him. 
And he's still a stone of stumbling for a whole lot of folks today. He's the only means of salvation. And so many are ashamed of Jesus. Paul says, whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. What's that song we sing? I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend his cause. I'm not ashamed. Don't blame God. Don't blame God if you're lost. It's your own fault if you trip over Jesus. He's offering you salvation, but if you reject him, there's no way possible you can be saved. Your thoughts on Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, 33 verses. I got a sneeze. I don't hear any comments, so we'll move, we'll move on. Romans 10. And we sort of title Romans 10, the rejection of Israel. The, the theme really is Romans 9 through 11. He's talking primarily about the Jews. Is Paul talking about the Jews because he hates them? He's one of them. I mean, he is their flesh and blood, their kin through, through, uh, through Abraham. He doesn't hate them. That's verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is what? I want them to be saved. Jonah did not want the Gentiles to be saved. As we've said, he hoped they'd burn. But Paul isn't telling the Jews off. He's not blasting them. Deep down inside, he is hurting. He feels for them. And he's praying for them. Do we need to pray for the lost? I tell you what, when we look at our world today, we've got a lot to be praying for, don't we? We've got an awful lot to be praying for. It's easy to complain. And I fall into that category sometimes, but I have to ask myself, you know, you know, you've complained about this. How much have you, what, prayed about this? How much have you prayed about this? And, and this, oh, this infighting of politics and the Supreme Court that's going to be picked and, oh, World War III, some are just beside themselves in hysteria. Pray about it. Pray about it. At the end of the day, everything's going to be fine. As we often say, no matter who's in the White House, what? Yes. God's on the throne. Give it to Him. Pray about it. Pray about it. You know, if, you've got, if you're at odds with, with this or have a problem with this, pray about it. Somebody well said, it is hard to be mad at somebody if you are what? Praying for them. It's hard to be mad at somebody if you're mentioning them by name and praying for them. So that's something to think about. Paul, I don't hate the Jews. My, I don't hate the Jews. We don't hate the lost. Heart is breaking that you are lost. I want you to be saved. So were the Jews saved? At this point in Romans 10, 1, were they saved? If they were saved, why would he pray that they might be saved? He knew they were what? They were lost. Anybody, it doesn't matter Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter where you live, anybody who rejects Christ is lost. It's not my judgment, that's what the Bible says. I cannot go to heaven, I cannot be saved apart from Jesus Christ. I may be a good person, I may believe in God the Father, but if I don't accept the Son, I am lost. That's the position of the Jews and anybody else. I don't hate you, I love you. Heart's breaking for you. I'm praying for you to be saved. In fact, let me talk about you for a moment in a good way. Let me pat you on the back where I can. I bear them record, that, that is the Jews, I bear them record, they have a zeal of God. It is not that they're atheists. It's not that they don't believe in God at all. I'm talking about a people, I'll give them this much, they are zealous for God. What does it mean to be zealous? Some people are zealous when it comes to college football, aren't they? What does that mean? They hate it? They love it. they ardent to be hot, to be fervent. The Jews were on fire for God. Yes, they were. They were. They loved God. They were zealous for God. 
At one time they sort of slipped off into idolatry, but since the Babylonian captivity, they learned at least one thing, they learned not to bow down to idols anymore. They worshiped the one true God. Now they did it in the wrong way, but they had a zeal for God. The problem was their zeal was misdirected. It was not according to what? Knowledge. They were enthused, but their enthusiasm was misdirected. Have you ever been zealous about something and when you finished that something you found out you did it all wrong? My first car was a 1968 Mustang. What I wouldn't give to still have that car today. Why didn't I keep that car? How much would that have been worth today had I kept that up? 68 Mustangs didn't go in the snow, though. We got a lot of snow back in those years, so I traded it off for a Chevy something or other that wouldn't go in the snow either. It's supposed to have been a four-wheel dra- drive, and I bought a two-wheel drive, and it was practically useless, too. But my first car was a 68 Mustang. It was white. It was the envy of people in Sharon, Tennessee. Owain didn't have many things people were envious of, but they were envious of my 68 Mustang. I mean, it was a nice, nice car, and I bought it. And that was my first car. I'd never waxed a car before. So I washed my Mustang really nice. Out in the blazing sun, not in the shade, in the blazing sun, I got me a big can of turtle wax. And I waxed and I waxed that Mustang and I let it set about two hours out in that blazing sun. I almost had to use a grinder to get that wax off. Oh, I was zealous. Instructions, I don't need instructions. Who needs instructions? Well, (laughs) you live and learn, right? Zealous, zealous, but not according to knowledge. There is no value in being zealous for God if it's not matched with knowledge. Was Paul zealous for God before his conversion? It was called Saul then, wasn't he, Adam? Oh, he was zealous. You wouldn't find a more zealous man. He was even giving his vote against Christians to put them to death, all the while thinking what? I'm doing the right thing. This is the right thing for me to do, and only later he found out how wrong he was. He was on fire for God, but he was wrong. Are there people like that today? Are there people today who are indeed zealous for God, but it's not backed by knowledge? Who might some of those people be? People ever come by your door and knock on your door, especially on a Saturday? And you've got all sorts of projects going on on Saturday around our house. We've got all sorts of projects. And on Saturday, a lot of times our Jehovah Witness friends will come around. And if you don't think they're zealous, think again. How many people do you find out knocking doors on a Saturday? What's another group that does a lot of door knocking? Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, they prefer the term Latter-day Saints, but they're not insulted by the term Mormons. And if you don't think they're zealous to spend two years as a young person away from home in a mission field to knock doors and bear the brunt of ridicule and, and scorn, you better believe they're zealous. They believe, firmly believe in what they believe. What's the problem? It's not according to knowledge. It's not according to knowledge. It's is the problem. People who say, well, I wouldn't trade this feeling in my heart for a stack of Bibles 10 miles high. Zeal for God, but they distance themselves from the knowledge found in the Word of God. You've got to have zeal, yes. I think maybe we could use a bit more zeal. I think we have the knowledge. Our problem is we need a fire under us. We need the zeal. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Notice verse 3, they being ignorant of God's righteousness. What's the old phrase? Ignorance is bliss. Well, not in spiritual matters, it's not. And not when it comes to waxing your car either, believe you me. They being ignorant of God's righteousness. Why were they ignorant? Was it their fault? You better believe it was their fault. They had the Word of God, they had the prophets. Notice they were going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. They had the truth. In essence, they're saying, we're going to do this our way. 
ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness. People doing their own thing religiously. And I'll close with this as we're about out of time. Some of us may remember the song that Tom T. Hall used to sing. Me and Jesus got our own thing going, right? Me and Jesus got it all worked out. Don't need anybody to tell us what it's all about. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. Well, number one, that is atrocious English, correct? <laughs> Should have been Jesus and I. But how do you rhyme with I? But more than that, it's atrocious theologically. It is wrong. The assumption is, well, I don't need a Bible. I don't need a preacher. I don't need a sermon. Me and Jesus, we've got it all worked out. I've already worked it out with him and I'm already saved. Well, no offense to Tom T. Hall, but uh, uh, we, the Bible would have to beg to differ with that. All right, now that we've insulted all Tom T. Hall fans everywhere, we'll close and pick up next week, Lord willing, Romans 10, verse number 4.